Well, you came just on time. Joining me, Nisim Black, a top rap star for a very long time, and today he's huge and he has millions and millions of viewers on YouTube and live broadcasts. Uh, Nisim, I want to ask you a question very direct. You've been mm -hmm. in the music business for a very long time, right. but you haven't been in the Judaism business for a very long time. <laughs> right. Your life has changed dramatically. I mean, 15 years ago, you were in a completely different place than you are today. Right. Where were you and how did you get here? Uh, 15 years ago. <laughs> About 15 years ago, I was actually a um, hardcore um, Christian in high school, actually, uh, I say Bible thumping Christian. That time, I was involved in a, um, a youth uh, youth ministry um, uh, for the Union Gospel Mission Youth Missionary uh, Group, and I was involved in every single like Bible study group leadership, uh, and it was actually very good for me. Uh, coming from the inner city, um, being exposed to a lot of violence and drug abuse and and, and that type of thing. Um, it was very important for me to be around, um, uh, you know, a healthy environment to be able to cultivate, you know, proper social skills and being able to have a proper understanding of just really how to move in life. So it was very good for me at the time. Um, it also got me out of a lot of trouble, um, you know, prior to a, a missionary camp experience that I had in which I converted to Christianity. My first introduction to religion was Islam. My grandfather was a Sunni Muslim. So I used to pray five times a day and everything like that. He went to prison and then, you know, the streets just just have you. So going along, um, being affiliated with a gang, Black Gangsta Disciple Nation, GDN, Gangsta Disciple Nation, um, um, that led to uh, me being in a very, very uh, vulnerable place, I guess, at least spiritually. Grandfather wasn't around. There was no, like, religious thing at home. Um, so I ended up going to this camp um, where I ended up converting. It probably saved my life at the time, to be honest. Probably saved my life. It at the saved time. your life from drugs. From and the, the drugs and, and from the streets and from everything like that. It probably was. But as I continued to, to grow, I got older, um, nothing from that would stick you know what I mean? As you as you go, most people that know um, within that world, there's not a lot about um, ethics. There's no masora like we have nothing to mm. really, no you know, to, no tradition to to really keep you. So you end up in a place where you can continue making it up as you go, type mm. of thing, um, interpreting things the way you want to interpret them. And so before long, you know, I was back out, uh, you know, uh, putting out rap records that were very very. Uh, detrimental, you know, I feel like, you know, to, to myself, but also to the community that I, um, I was around. And um, s uh, after a while, there was another artist who, you know, made like a, a diss track on me. And uh, that led to a physical altercation, which eventually led to a kill or be killed situation. What or, does that me, mean? Kill it means kill. kill or be killed, you know, it was it put me in a situation, a friend of mine. Like Tupac? He, 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 very similar in sense of, um, in the sense of, if I don't go and take them out first, then they're gonna come after me. What happens in rap, and what was happening during this time, was this whole thing about rap battles. And one of the one local guy thought that he would make a record about me, behind my back, and uh, and, and maybe I would I would say something back, and then it'd be the talk of the city, talk of the town. And then when we heard the song, we decided, we do. So we decided we just go beat the guy up. And he won't make any more songs. So we went, and we went to a nightclub that we knew that he was going to be at. And uh, so we went up there. We had, we got into this altercation, and it was, it was an altercation, but it wasn't the worst one. So I didn't think anything of it. I left after, you know, put the rest of my clothes on, all that type of thing. We went to the, to the office of our independent record label. All of a sudden, I got a phone call. The phone call was from a friend. He said, the police are looking for you. I said, for, for what? For fighting at a nightclub? What I do, I damage a wine glass. I don't know what's going to be. 
So, and uh, I said, no, the police are saying that you were shooting. You were shooting in the nightclub and that you, you were, sh I said, no way. I know I didn't even have a gun at the time. So I hung up the phone and I'm panicking now because I don't know what this person's talking about. And I remember being with the rest of my friends. We ran downstairs and ran out. And now I'm on my way home because my heart's beating because police are looking for me because I supposedly was shooting. And we see from a distance sirens and we see the, the, the lights of the, of the of police car. So we tiptoe a little closer and a little closer. Now, I want to let you know, was it this guy? black people usually don't go towards the sirens. We're not looking to go find out what's going on. We used to go the other way. But for whatever reason, I was very interested in knowing what was going on, especially after knowing the police you know, were looking for us. So we started walking tiptoeing, and the closer and closer I got, I seen that it was a good friend of mine who, in my honor and in my defense, he decided to go up and try to take the other guy's life. And uh, un unfortunately, but fortunately, in the streets, you know, guys don't usually do target practice, so they miss a lot. And that's what happened in this particular case. He missed, and he didn't hit him. He hit the pole and the car and other things, but he didn't hit the actual person. So I remember going back and, and later on finding all this out. I had no idea what's going to happen. And then so I had the next thoughts the next morning when I figured out, when I got a call and they told me everything that ha what happened and what the situation was, and I put two and two together, now I'm fearing for my life. Why am I in fear for my life? Because there's codes in the streets. One of the things are, is when you bring a gun into a situation, if we fight, we fight. But once a gun is brought into the situation, then that means it's either you die or I die. What a world. Very, very scary place to be in. Um, but the beautiful part about it is, is that being in such a situation gives you um, a real thinking moment and it gives you the ability to make a serious cheshman. Uh, cheshman and nefesh. You really get to really weigh it out and think about it. And once it's real and your life is on the line, then you really start to think about, like, is this who I, who I really am? I was thinking to myself, how did I go from Bible study and being a part of the missionary groups? and all? Like, how did I go from that to being, like, in this situation? So um, God made a miracle for me. Three days after praying and crying and trying to figure out some other way out of the situation, um, the other guy called me. And after I got that call, um, I realized, you know, after we were able to put things behind us, I realized that that was a it was another chance to make a to make a better decision. And so I got away from, you know, a lot of my friends and and I just stayed home and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I had a lot of prayers. And I got to a place where um, I started to think back to when I was in Bible study group, like I had a lot of questions. You know, what <laughs> so ended up happening, I ended up being introduced to Rabbi Google. <laughs> mm. Rabbi Google had every answer to every Shiloh that I had, right? Mm. Um, so I went on. I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, right? And I didn't know. Is that Seattle? Anything, you know, in Seattle, in Seward Park area. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I grew up there. I would see people going. I used to walk through a shul, you know, I was a young kid uh, going to school every day and different things. But I never knew anything about Judaism. Um, but I knew about Islam, I knew about Christianity, so I wanted to sort of like, you know, figure out what's, what's the differences, what, what do they believe in that, so I started searching and doing a lot of research. Um, another area I spent a lot of time on was the, um, the, the roots of Christianity, where, the, where it all, all began, mm -hmm. right? I got very intrigued and very interested. Um, so I started doing a lot of digging on there. And then I started getting into other uh, pieces of manuscripts that, you know, would be, I don't know how they would consider them today, pseudopigraph or whatever, the Didache, some of the church fathers. And I started going really, really back and starting to figure out, like, hold on, this had nothing to do with this. Um, so that led me um, to Messianic Judaism first. So I ended up going to a Messianic um, temple, that, which was very advanced for most of, you know, what you would see in Messianic Judaism. Hmm. There you walk in, looks like a real shul, oh, yeah. beautiful, on Kodesh, they read from the Sefer Torah, um, you know, most of the, the service was actually in Hebrew, people had, you know, 
Mm. It was like a, you know, interesting... For me, it was a culture shock at the time. I was like, mm. did I walk into what I thought I walked into? Mm. You know, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, mm. So I was like, wow, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. So I need to catch up. So I spent a lot of time on Chabad.org, <laughs> <Wow. laughs> which ended up leading me to go into a Chabad, uh, to a Chabad house on the, on the east side. And so all the while, I keep trying to play catch up. I'm starting to see that the authenticity, what I was really after, what I was looking for was over here. And it wasn't over here, right? Um, the more and more I grew um, in terms of Judaism, the further and further distant this place seemed to be from actual Judaism. And, um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me was just having a longing to find what was the authentic way that God wanted us to serve him, wanted, wanted the world to serve him. What was that uh, authentic way, right? One of the things that uh, Jesus actually says over there, he says that, the, the the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Matthew 23. Matthew 23. So he says that, and whatever they shall tell you, whatever they you shall do. do. Right. right, right. So that always bothered me. Really? That bothered you? It bothered me, it bothered right? Me. Because aren't they the bad guys, right? Right. So there's, there's almost like this uh, allegiance he's giving to, you know, at that time, what we would say now is birthed into rabbinical Judaism. And it's like, but nobody's like, so if they have the authority, then how do the apostles have the authority now if these guys are the ones that are sitting in the seat of Moses? So, you know, these things I found very, very hard to wrestle with. Um, so at one point, um, I put all of the books together. I got a Quran. I had the few different versions of the New Testament. And I had a JPS Tanakh. And... Um, Apart from Tanakh, I had, uh, I had a Chumash, and I started putting all these books in eight hours a day. I was going through all these different texts because I was really confused. Um, and the thing that, that um, stood out to me about the Tanakh at the time was the honesty of the story, right? There's so many ups and downs. You know, whenever you read the Gospels or whatever, it's just like... This figure who was just great, nothing Jesus bad. Was Jesus was perfect. Once Paul a... converts again to a thing, <laughs> right? Exactly. Right. Like... Everybody's perfect. Right. There's no whatever. And so the the honesty of the story of the just the constant ups and downs that Claudius Rowe was experiencing was my life story. <laughs> you understand? Wow. That was my life story. So it really, really, I felt more connected. Um, and being able to read it by myself was was like even more powerful. And so I, I made a deal with God. Like right before I started to really, you know, go out on the limb and, and, and really go all out and, and start searching and really go on my journey, I made a deal with him. I narrowed it down um, to, to the Tanakh after going through all the different, different and I, I narrowed it down and I said like this, I put on the table, I said, God, we're going to make a deal. I'm going to read this book from cover to cover, and the only thing I want is your character. I want mm -hmm. to know who you are. I want to know what you love. I want to know what you hate. I want to know. We're starting all over because what I thought I knew, I didn't know. So um, I never felt, you know, coming from, you know, Christian background, I never felt so, uh, so much connection you know, to Moshe Rabbein or to Moses mm. or to David or to like the stories were just popping out. They were coming out even more because I was seeing the struggle, you know, and that resonated with me. So um, as I continue to progress and one of the things that you can't ignore when you keep seeing inside the Torah is you come to a place where you start to realize, you know, for the first time I was waking up to see that all these things that he was talking, all these prophecies and all these beautiful words and sayings that I had heard, you know, in the Christian group, that wasn't talking about the church, that was talking about the J Jewish people. He said, you see this unique relationship. And I always say like this, if you are best friends with somebody, you spend a lot of time with that other person, right? You will find yourself um, taking on a lot of the same characteristics as that other person. You'll start to l laugh and enjoy the same exact things. You spend so much time together that you start to rub off on one another. I was spending so much time with Hashem, trying to find them, that with Hashem's interest became mine, and I fell in love with the Jewish people because I was reading inside the text. That's who Hashem loved. So it was a very, very powerful time for me. 
Shim does this amazing thing where he just like puts me in a place to where it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's a reset button, you know. I think the most powerful thing about the, the Judaism thing is that, you know, maybe had I not got into that altercation, I would have never started praying. Mm -hmm. I would have never started, you know, soul searching, start seeking. So then that put me in that place of vulnerability again where it was like, you know, God, what do you want from me type of thing. Things happen in layers. There were layers of truth. How did I be able to become a fan of Rabbi Tovia Singer? The layers of truth start to break off. So the first thing you start to get into is, obviously, I went from the holidays. That led me into Messianic Judaism. That was one layer peeled off. Then you start to see the importance of rabbinical Judaism because even in the Messianic scriptures, is nonstop. Paul uses it as an excuse to say, this is what I'm, I'm only came to talk about the resurrection of the dead. When he speaks about it in Acts, he uses it because he's obviously saying that he believes in, 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 in Prushim. James tells him, says, hey, listen, we know you're not telling the non-Jews, so this is what you'll do. You'll make a sacrifice to show that you're still on the derech. You haven't gone off the derech. You haven't gone off the derech. You circumcised Timothy, and then we know right, you're really exactly. on your Shemayim. But the more and more I started learning about Judaism, these started to have different meaning to me. Before, they were just stories in the Bible. Then all of a sudden, hold on. Paul circumcises Timothy because his mother was Jewish. Was right. not Jewish. But that's Is all it? rabbinic, right? It's all rabbinic. How do you know you're Jewish by your mother? You you, in, exactly. In, 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 so let me tell you, you are like so sophisticated that you did that. You know, like yeah. ninety nine point nine percent of Christians wouldn't have even because even they think about because when they go on the journey, they're not digging for everything. Because even in Christian commentaries, a lot of time quotes you know midrashim and different right. things. And it's just like, where are they getting this stuff from? So when I started learning more about Judaism, I started to say, wow. So that was another layer, another layer of letting you off and opening your heart to that certain, you know, that vulnerability that you need to be able to accept Emma's. So. And then you came, you actually decided, I'm, you embraced the Jewish faith, the yeah. Jewish nation, converted right. to Judaism. Right. We are sitting here in Eretz Yisrael, in the Holy Land. Right, right. We are in the place where almost all of Tanakh was written. Right. How did that come to be that you said, I want to be a Jew? <clears throat> I think from the moment I started learning about Judaism, I wanted to be in Eretz Yisrael. You know, long before I was actually finished converting, like, I'm moving to Israel. My wife did not agree, but I'm moving. Somehow, some way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move. And the um, whole story is actually a little funny. Um, I got... <laughs> After we had finished converting, uh, maybe a year after, um, you know, I really started bringing up to my wife, you know, how much I went to move to Israel. Israel, my wife, I don't know the language. I don't, I wouldn't know my way around. I don't know people there. Not happening. Um, and I brought it up so much that it was like an illegal word to say in the house. Really? It's real, like, because she was like, no, 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 no. I can't. She's not doing it. You have to take me there if I go visit, whatever. So I got to a place where it was illegal for me to bring it up. We're not moving to Israel. It's not happening. Um, so uh, I did a lot of a lot of tefillahs. I went out and I prayed every day, you know. She opened my wife's heart, you know. I was really begging Hashem. It was so emiss to me that we needed to be there. You know, after converting to Judaism, it's one thing. You live in America, it's a beautiful thing, there's beautiful communities there, but there's no way to really immerse yourself inside of the inside of the heart of Yiddishkeit once until once you're here in the land and everybody that's in in Chutzlaritz, they know it. Once you come here, it's a different story. It's a different uh different vibe altogether. And 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 I really wanted that. I wanted it for me, I wanted it for my children. Um, being of color, I uh, wanted them to be in a place where they're going to also see other people of color, of faith, and the same faith as them, and things like that. So Israel was big for us for that purpose also. Mm. My wife still was not a fan, and I went, and I, I was in Uman one year for Rosh Hashanah. I spent a lot of time in his boat. It's like four hours, and I only dabbled on there to Israel, as in my heart was yearning so bad to move there to Israel. So Uma, Uman is Rav Nachman's Caver, it's his grave right. in the Ukraine, yes, where yes, a lot sir. of people go as a pilgrimage. They don't pray to the rabbi, they no, pray to no. God, but mm -hmm. it's a place of inspiration. It's a place of inspiration. Yeah. A month later, I was in London, and seven days, uh, I was out on a speaking tour at a concert. Two days after I was there, I was sitting in the living room, my wife said, you know what, I think we should move to Israel. Mm. It was just like that. And it was almost like it was her idea. It wasn't her idea. I had the idea, right? So um, the the interesting part about it where it kind of got a little funny was um, 
for the whole year prior, I had filled out all the Nefesh Ben Nefesh paperwork and I forged her signature on all the That's paperwork. Good. <laughs> so by the time we'll she said... that one out, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time she said, let's go, we had all the paperwork, we're ready to go. And she was actually happy I did it. But um, So in the end, we ended up moving and uh, maybe... Three and a half months after that, we were on the plane. We left everything behind. Baruch Hashem. Everything behind. Baruch Hashem. And yeah. now we're together in our show. That is my story. Thank you very much.